Uh, my interest in the Emancipation Proclamation and its impact is sort of slightly different from the, I think, point of view that others may have. I'm not a political historian, and my interest is not so much on the issues that Lincoln was concerned about, about if he passed the Emancipation Proclamation or if he wrote it and he signed it, what might happen in terms of the politics of the time, or how it might affect the Civil War. My interest is more in the effect that was going to have in the African American community in this country at that time. Because if there was one group that was solidly behind the idea of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, it was the African American community. Uh, Frederick Douglass had been at the White House and had talked to Lincoln and been lobbying for having this uh, bill passed, as well as having African Americans in the military for quite a long time. And they were very much in favor and pushing for Lincoln moving forward and pushing this forward. For them, it would be a change in their lives, a change in the lives of their families and friends who were still in slavery, but also a change in the lives of those who were free as well, because those connections and their status in the country would be different, and the threat of being back in slavery might disappear as well. So it's not very surprising that on the night of December 31st, 1862, that African Americans all across the country gathered together waiting for midnight and waiting to learn that Lincoln had in fact signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And to have the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation that had been issued earlier turn into a final, actual Emancipation Proclamation and it ends slavery, uh, at least as a military activity. What it did was to create a new day for African Americans in this nation, to change their status and change the possibilities they might have for the future. And I think it's also important to talk about this event in terms of what it means, not only to people like Frederick Douglass, but what it meant also to those who were still enslaved. I don't think we learned enough or talked enough about how this change rolled across the nation, how it affected their lives, and how they stepped forward or reacted to these changes as they were informed about it and allowed to uh, be a part of this change taking place. We do know that uh, for those who were living in close proximity to uh, the Union's troops, that in fact the Emancipation Proclamation's implementation <coughs> meant they could be free. And you could see this in terms of the African Americans who were in places like Fort Monroe in Virginia, or New York, North Carolina, who were already at Union lines or who flocked to Union lines as a way of gaining their freedom. They knew this would change their lives in important kind of ways. But there are other places where they weren't near Union lines that, where the changes took place differently. As we know, the Emancipation Proclamation only freed those who were located in proximity to the Union Army, uh, but not in places still controlled by the Confederates. So in those places, the uh, sign of the Emancipation Proclamation was an interesting activity, but it didn't change their lives immediately or quickly. It only changed as the uh, impact of the Union <coughs> Army began to unfold towards the individuals. And I think what we can learn about this is, uh, learn more about this through, is by beginning to understand what those who were enslaved themselves were seeing and feeling and thinking as this uh, proclamation's impact began to spread across places they were, they were located. What I'd like to suggest is that one of the best ways to do that is what the ambassador had mentioned, and that is looking at the slave narratives that were initiated by the WPA in the 1930s. If you don't know much about them, they were essentially interviews done by the WPA that first began as interviews of older residents of the United States. They wanted to capture the history of this country in the words of those who had lived it. But what they found in the process of these interviews was that <coughs> among them, especially among the African Americans of the interview, particularly in the South, that you had a generation of individuals who themselves had been enslaved during and after the Civil War. And from their interviews, you began to get an insight into what their lives were like, but also how emancipation and the end of the Civil War changed their lives. And I think looking at those narratives also gives us a feeling about how the Emancipation Proclamation, how the ending of slavery began to impact them, and how it rolled towards them. And one of the interesting things in looking at this that you learn very quickly is that as the Emancipation Proclamation is put into force, you have this interesting decision made by quite a few slaveholders. They decide that rather than have the Union troops come into their area and then free those who are, are, are enslaved to them, they were going to move them further south. It's an interesting term that came up in the narratives which they called refugee. And essentially it meant that the slaveholder would take those who he controlled and they would march them further south to places where they thought they would remain enslaved 
or at least with the Union Army would not take control very quickly. Most often they wanted a place like Louisiana and also the state of Texas. And there they believed, especially in Texas, that if um, the war continued the same way that it would, that the last place in which slavery would come to an end would be in the state of Texas. And they thought even after the Civil War, maybe Texas might be an outpost where they might not come to an end. So you had a number of African Americans talking about the narrative of being sort of um, um, packing up in the middle of the night and being marched south from places like Alabama and Mississippi to Texas where they were supposed to be protected from this institution of slavery, uh, from the Emancipation Proclamation and the possibility of, 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 of being free. It's interesting how they talk about it because they say they listen to the slaveholders. The slaveholder very often said to them, we're doing this to protect you, to take care of you, to, to um, and make sure that you're not uh, bothered by these changes that are taking place. But in fact, they were watched out for their own well-being. But these narratives, I think, give us an interesting insight into the kinds of steps that Southerners are taking as the Emancipation Proclamation was passed. They recognized that there's been a change in their lives, and they wanted to protect the way they were living as much as they could as possible. Also what was in, in, interesting was watching how the impact of the Emancipation Proclamation slowly spread across the South. Because the key to this is the arrival of new troops in different locations, and then the announcement or the enforcement of the Emancipation Proclamation giving freedom to these individuals. And again, for the narrative, you get interesting insights into how this unfolds. In some instances, it was just a matter of the Union troops coming into a farm uh, area and announcing freedom to the enslaved. And they were, in fact, free at that moment. In other places, they'd have a huge ceremony in the middle of town, bring everyone together and make this major announcement about the slaves being free, often with the admon admonition that you should now lead a good life not do anything wrong and enjoy your freedom and not do anything to embarrass yourself or your countrymen in the process. Also, it was interesting watching how slaveholders themselves anticipated the arrival of Union troops and how they uh, did this. The narratives talk a lot about slaveholders uh, one day telling everyone to come together, that we have an announcement to make. And then bringing all those who had worked for them as slaves for a long period of time and saying, you are now free. You are as free as I am. You can do whatever you want to. And listening to the ways that the enslaved responded to this, and it varied across the board. Some were joyous, joyous, and they just leapt and screamed and sang and were very happy. One person talked about they all sang like blue jays because they were so happy about what was going on. Others just dropped the tools they had in their hands right away and walked away because they had been hoping to have this happen for a long time and took advantage of it. Others, I think, weren't quite sure how to think about this. Because freedom in the abstract is a wonderful, enticing kind of experience. And freedom in reality and how that sorts out is a much more challenging thing to begin to think about. And I think for many of them, it was trying to figure out what freedom meant. And they had different ways in which they described it. I think for me, one of the most interesting ones was a quote I got from one individual who talked about freedom in this way. He said what freedom meant to him was that he could do as he pleased and do some of the things he'd always wanted to do. He dreamed about doing but wasn't allowed to do because he was under control of his slave master. So that these, I think this change for them was a very important and an interesting one in their lives. But surprisingly, as you read through the narratives, the reactions are, aren't always what you expect that in fact some of them are not as positive or enthusiastic about this change in their lives. What we have to keep in mind is that this is the life they had known forever. And now you're saying your life is going to be different. You're going to have to change it entirely. You're, you're now in control of the choices that you can make. And I think they're trying to figure out what this <coughs> freedom actually means in application. And that uncertainty at time can be troubling. In one level, there were bonds that developed between those who were enslaved and those who enslaved them. And this closeness made it difficult for people to break away. There were children that they had raised from uh, being very young to adults who they were close to. And so in some instances you had individuals who decided that rather than to leave, they were going to remain on the plantation and stay connected with those individuals. And quite a few stayed there for several years after, after the end of the Civil War and their freedom 
Others, though, decided that they were not going to stay there any longer. That they had slaveholders who had been cruel to them, who they had no empathy for, and they were going to leave and go off on their own. But the problem was, what did going off on your own mean? How do you begin to sort that out? How does your life unfold in that setting? What we know is that as uh, people are given their freedom, they're not given some of the tools that they really need in order to enjoy and to leverage that freedom. The acquisition of land is nearly impossible to, to get. The rights as, on the political level, on the economic <coughs> level, are very much uh, controlled by others. So their ability to act as citizens, to act as free people, is very much limited by the surroundings in which they're in. Also for others, there's this sense of intimidation. And for many of us, there's a sense of intimidation. One of the times when I, I read about the slaveholder talking to the slaves and saying they were free, that you could do whatever you want to, is he said that someone else came up behind him and said, if any of you decide or, or choose to leave here, you will be killed. Because we expect you to continue to work here uh, as you had before. So this factor of intimidation is there as well. And even when it isn't stated, it is a concern that many individuals have in terms of how they are going to adjust to this new world, to these new channels that are, that are facing them. For them, I think freedom was a wonderful possibility that they were willing to embrace and weren't quite sure what the meaning would be altogether. And what is also interesting is seeing how long it sometimes took for the idea of freedom, the emancipation proclamation, to reach those individuals. Probably the most interesting place uh, to look at this is in the state of Texas. We talked about people being a refugee to, to Texas because they felt that might be the last place where slavery would be ended. Well, in fact, it's the case. Is that in Texas, even after the end of the Civil War, people were kept in enslavement for a long time. It's actually not until June of 1865, June 19, that you begin to have this announcement across the state that in fact those who were enslaved were free. And indeed, this is the derivation, as many of us know, of what is called Juneteenth, which is finally the recognition and the announcement that those who are enslaved are now free. One person in the narrative referred to this as a Negro Fourth of July celebration, Juneteenth, which I think is very much true. So I think that the key here is beginning to understand the complexities and the challenges that emancipation brought into the African American community and what it brought to those who were enslaved. I think many of us in our mind believe that it is a very straightforward process. Freedom comes and people then are able to embrace that and to have a new life. But in fact, it's much more complicated. Complicated by the fact that the economic and the political circumstances are different. Complicated by relationships that have evolved over time uh, that make it hard to pull away. But I think what is very true about the Emancipation Proclamation and, and the response of African, African Americans to this, especially those who were enslaved, was that given all the ups and downs, given the uncertainty, that in fact they were glad that it took place because it does change their lives. And I sort of want to end with a quote from one of those in the narratives that I think gives us a sense of the meaning of the Emancipation Proclamation for them. And it's by a woman by the name of Belle Carruthers of Mississippi. And what she said in the narratives is that it was true that under slavery we were fed clothed and sheltered. But I am like the man that said, give me freedom or give me death. And given the option, I'd rather be free than to have all these other benefits that might go with it. So I think her words and others, I think, found in slave narratives give us a wonderful view in an alternative way of how the Emancipation Proclamation impacted the African American community and how complicated the rollout of that was for these individuals who had uh, suffered in these two of slavery for such a long time.